All right, will you please stand for the reading of God's word? And this morning, we're just going to read it together because it's so short, okay? Exodus 20, 13, let's read it together. You shall not murder. This is God's word. You may be seated. We don't do that for the 50 verse text, but I thought it was fitting today. Um, we live in a, in a very unique moment of history. And I know I've said that, and there's a danger in wearing that out. If you say unique a million times, it's not unique anymore. But it, this is a unique moment in history. And one of the things that is unique about it is that we are, uh, whether it's through media, social media, whatever it is, the schools, we are constantly being bombarded with what can only be described as a totalitarian or leftist vision of the future, meaning a vision of where we want to take things. And that vision of the future is very much uh, in line with the vision that John Lennon tried to persuade us of in the song, Imagine. It is a world without God. It is a world without objective standards. It is a world without reward or consequences for our actions. It is a world without borders and countries. It is a world in which personal property does not exist because the state owns everything. That's, that's the world that many are contending for today. And in that world, in that reality, in that future, the state replaces God. The state is supreme over the family, whatever a family may happen to be. Male and female are no longer meaningful words or categories. Masculinity is evil. Mutilation is care. Euthanasia is compassionate. Infanticide is justice. According to that world, death is king. Death is what is celebrated. Now I want you to consider how profoundly different and wonderful and beautiful the world of the Ten Commandments is. And for this morning, just think about this single command. Do not murder. Imagine what the world would look like if we just took those words seriously. It's, it's, it's interesting to think about what, what people are trying to remove in the world. Like, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of pressure. Let's remove the combustible engine. Wouldn't the world be great if there was no engines, right? <laughs> but but how, how about if we got rid of murder? You hear anybody saying that? Imagine no abortion. That alone would save over 60 million people in our country. Not the world, just in our country in the last 50 years or so. Uh, imagine no communist regimes. Leaders such as Lenin and Stalin and Mao are responsible for over 100 million deaths in the 20th century. 100 million deaths. Deaths. Do you know how many people have been devastated and destroyed because of these murderous tyrants? Generations that do not exist because of murder. Can you imagine what the world would look like if there was no unlawful taking of life? It's beautiful. It's profound. That's what this command invites us to consider. So we're going to think about this command. As simple as it is, we're going to think about what this command teaches us about our dignity, our hands, and our hearts. Our dignity, our hands, and our hearts. We'll begin by considering our dignity in week one, we looked at the first commandment, which, com which prohibits us from worshiping any other gods, right? We're not to worship any other god. And if you remember in that week, I talked about how that commandment reveals something to us about our nature. What the first commandment reveals to us is that all human beings are fundamentally worshiping beings. 
right? It's not a question of if you worship. Everybody worships. The question is, what do you worship? And because worship is central to what it means to be a human being, because worship is assumed, idolatry is forbidden in the first commandments. Likewise, here in the sixth commandment, the prohibition against murder is built upon a biblical conviction and assumption of human dignity. In Genesis 9, verse 6, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. Genesis 9 explicitly states what the sixth commandment assumes, that being that all human beings, born and unborn, young and old, rich and poor, fully functional and disabled, all human beings are made in the image of God. That is to say that all human beings are made by God and that they bear the image of God, made by God and bear the image of God. So I want to look at those two things. What does it mean to say that we are made by God? Well, first, it means that humanity is not a mistake. We are not the unintended consequence of time and space. We are not the descendants of microscopic, spontaneously formed spherical lipid molecules, as Alexander Oparin suggested. We are not complicated, sophisticated, advanced apes, as Darwin tried to suggest, though admittedly, some politicians present us with a compelling case for his theory. (laughs) We did not evolve out of something, and we did not evolve out of nothing. That is impossible. The Bible tells us, for God made man in his own image. And and just to clarify, there was absolutely nothing in Genesis that would indicate that what, what it means is that God started a very basic form of life that through a very long process of evolution would eventually lead to human life. That's not in the text. Genesis 1 verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. From the very beginning, man was not an animal. There is a distinction from day one, or rather we should say from day six, man had dominion over the animals. And this is not just true for Adam and Eve, meaning that God created them. It's not saying that God made Adam and Eve in his image, and then God somehow removed himself from the process of reproduction from that point on. It's not as if Adam and Eve are the first domino that God tips and then walks away and just lets nature take its course. That's not true. In Psalm 139, it says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. God made Adam and Eve in his image, and every human being that has ever existed in the history of the world was also made by God in his image. We were knit together in the womb. So we are God's workmanship, made by him. But it also says that we are made in God's image. And while there is some debate as to all of the implications of what it means to be made in the image of God, there is no debate that to be made in the image of God is to possess an objective, intrinsic, undeniable, inescapable value and dignity. I have here a crinkled piece of paper, okay? And if I presented this to you and I said... What is this worth? What is this worth? Someone just said zero, right? It's a crinkled piece of paper, right? It's not worth anything as far as you know. But what if I told you this piece of paper is the piece of paper that Einstein sketched out his theory of relativity on for the very first time? 
Would that increase the value of this? Would this all of a sudden become desirable? Would you look at it differently? You would. You would. Friends, you are the canvas that God himself has sketched out his image upon. That means that you are incredibly valuable. Your life is objectively precious. And therefore, murder violates and transgresses the inescapable value and dignity of human life. To unlawfully, unjustly kill or to, or, or to murder is to destroy something that God has made, that something God has bestowed his image upon, something that is wonderful and mysterious and beautiful and valuable. It is to destroy what God calls precious. Which means as we think about what murder is, we have to take this idea one step further. We must go further into the truth. Al Mohler, in his commentary on this commandment, said this, in the Western legal tradition, we speak of murder as harm to the victim, the the victim's friends and family and circle of acquaintances. But in the scripture, the main harm is not the victim nor the victim's friends and family, but rather to the dignity of God himself. Whenever we sin, we don't just sin against a human being. When we sin, we sin against God. When we murder, we not only act violently against a human, we act violently against the image of God itself. And so murder is an attack against the glory and the dignity of the triune God. And therefore, we are told, do not murder. Next, our hands. What does this commandment teach us about our hands? And by our hands, what I'm talking about is our actions, what we do. We've understand it, understood it principally. What does this mean in terms of how we act? This command forbids something as well as it commends something. It tells us not to do, and in telling us not to do, it also tells us to do this. So what what is forbidden in this command? The word in English is to murder. As some of you may be more familiar with the translation that uses the word kill, but murder is not the same thing as killing. All murder involves killing, but all, all killing is murder. And so I want to acknowledge that there are situations in which it may be permissible or just to kill, situations that, that re- involve the taking of a life that is not a violation of the Sixth Commandment. The first example would be capital punishment. In Genesis 9, 6, again, it says, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. So the Bible is is telling us what justice looks like when somebody unlawfully, unjustly takes another person's life. How should that be dealt with? So this is premeditated, intentional murder. And in those instances, the death penalty is just. It is just. This would always the application of that death penalty would always require a fair and just trial and the penalty must be carried out by the state and not by the victims. But with those, in those circumstances, capital punishment is not a violation of the Sixth Commandment. Second, self-defense can be a just cause to kill. It's not always a just cause to kill, but it can be a just cause to kill. If there are other measures that can be taken to, that do not require killing, then those measures ought to be taken. 
But there are situations in which you have no other means of protecting yourself, someone else, or your family. And in those instances, acts of self-defense that result in death are not a violation of the Sixth Commandment. Third, just war. Throughout history, theologians and philosophers have tried to come up with categories, instances in which wars are biblically justifiable and instances in which war is not biblically justifiable. So some of the, some of the, um, the boundaries that they've come up with, the categories, are one, that a just war must be declared by a legitimate authority, someone that the authority has been vested in. So Joe Blow on the farm can't just decide our country's going to war. That power is only entrusted to a particular authority or authorities. Second, there must be a just cause, meaning the war must be carried out to deal with real evil in the world. There must be a just cause. Economic gain is not a just, just cause. Political gain is not a just cause. The cause itself must be just. Third, the means used in war must be used in proportion to the good desired. There must be proportionality between what the war will require and what it can accomplish. Fourth, it must be a last resort, meaning all other ways of addressing evil must be exhausted before war is on the table. And lastly, there must be a reasonable hope of success. So when these criteria are met, in those instances, a war must be just. And this is why we have God who in the commandments tells us not to murder, and that same God at times will call his people into war. War in and of itself is not murder. There is a distinction. These same principles would also apply to uh, those who work in law enforcement. There are times in which to protect yourself or to protect others, force must be applied. And sometimes that can result in somebody dying. That is not a violation of this commandment. So things like capital punishment, self-defense, and just war, these are situations in which it must be, it may be necessary and acceptable to kill. But outside of these instances, killing is forbidden. All unlawful taking of human life is forbidden. It is a violation of the sixth commandment. This, of course, would include abortion because abortion unjustly kills an innocent human life. So the unjust, all unjust taking of human life is forbidden. But we have to understand, right, this also commends something. The commandment goes in both directions. It says don't do this and do do this. So on the one hand, we must not unjustly take human life. On the other hand, we must do all that we can to protect human life. It's not enough just to say we're not going to take it. We also must honor human life by protecting human life. We see this principle in Deuteronomy chapter 22. It says, when you build a new house, you shall make a parapet on your roof that you may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house if anyone should fall from it. Now, we don't have parapets, but we do have these things called porches and decks. And they are often elevated. And what this text is telling us is that if you have an elevated porch, okay, essentially, and you don't have a handrail on that thing, and somebody falls from your porch and dies, guess who's responsible for that? You are. That's on you. So consequently, something as simple as putting up a handrail to protect human life is a faithful and true application of the six commandments. We must not just 
avoid the unlawful taking of human life. We must protect life. This is why supporting organizations that help to protect the unborn and people who are suffering from injustice, supporting, participating in those organizations is a faithful application of the sixth commandment because you are working to protect what God cherishes. Because the sixth commandment not only forbids us from taking life, it also commends us to do all that is in our power to protect human life because all human life is made in the image of God. Now, lastly, I want to look at our heart, okay? Because honestly, at this point, it's easy for us to assume that this commandment has very little to do with us. Because do any of you struggle with murder? Like, have you ever sat down with a buddy like, hey, I need to talk. I'm just going through some stuff. Like, hey, what's going on? It's like, you know, this week's been rough. I'm just really struggling with murder. And like, you back up. You're like, say it again. You're like, yeah, I mean, more so than other weeks. This week's been really bad. You probably have had a conversation like that which involved greed. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm, loving, I'm loving money. I'm not loving people. You, you've probably had a conversation about coveting. Like, yeah, I want what my neighbor has and my neighbor's a turkey and doesn't deserve it and I know that's wrong. You've probably had conversations about lying and you've probably had conversations about lust, but have you ever had a conversation? Brother, pray for me. Murder is just right there. You probably haven't. And there's a danger in thinking this probably has nothing to do with you. But it has everything to do with us. In Matthew 5, 21 through 22, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said of those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. What is Jesus doing? He's not correcting or critiquing the sixth commandment. That's not the problem. The issue is not what God said. The issue is how what God said was being misapplied. And Jesus takes the sixth commandment and he applies it all the way down, all the way into our hearts because murder doesn't begin in our hands. Murder begins in the heart. And one of the root causes of murder is anger. Now, clearly, not all anger is sin because we see Jesus angry, rightfully angry, in the Gospels. So not all anger is sin. There is such a thing as righteous anger. Righteous anger is the kind of anger that cries out to God for justice. That's right. Unrighteous anger takes judgment out of God's hands and it puts it into ours. Righteous anger grieves over how God's glory has been transgressed. Unrighteous anger grieves over how our glory has been transgressed. Righteous anger leaves the door open for forgiveness, reconciliation, and restoration. Unrighteous anger locks the door to grace and forgiveness and throws away the key. The kind of anger that, God, that, that Jesus is condemning is the anger that refuses to forgive. It's not just anger. It's the anger that refuses to forgive forgive. That kind of unrighteous anger is murder in infancy. And this is why Jesus instructs us to deal with these issues directly and quickly. In the following verses, he says this, so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. 
So there is a very real sense of urgency in these words. Have you sinned against your brother? Does he have something against you? Have you hurt him? And Jesus says, well, go find him. Go talk to him. Go repent and be reconciled. Not tomorrow, not next month, but, but now, right now. Matthew Henry said this, we ought carefully to preserve Christian love and peace with our brethren, and that if at any time a breach happens, we should labor for a reconciliation by confessing our fault, humbling ourselves to our brother, begging his pardon, and making restitution or offering satisfaction for wrong done in word or deed, according as the nature of the thing is, and that we should do this quickly. Because till this be done, we are utterly unfit for communion with God in holy ordinances. If you're in the communion line and you remember you've sinned against your brother, you should get out of the line and you should go and repent and be restored. Forgiveness must come first. Forgiveness must come first. Now, this morning, you may be on the other end of this equation, right? You may not be the person who has hurt a brother. You may be the one who has been hurt by a brother. You're the person who has been sinned against. And forgiveness may be the very last thing that you want to give. You may have been hurt so deeply You may have been hurt so many times. You hear that we should forgive and you're just saying, this is the last thing I want to do. I don't want to forgive. In fact, you may be so hurt by what you've experienced, you feel like you could never forgive that person. To forgive that person might feel like death. And... You're actually right, because forgiveness is a sort of death. David Pallison said this, forgiveness is mercifully unjust. Forgiveness is mercifully unjust. When we're hurt, we want other people to pay. When we forgive, we are freeing them from that judgment. We are freeing them from that verdict. They are not getting what they deserve. They're getting something better. Mercy. Forgiveness is never given because the offending party deserves it. Forgiveness is always given because we know firsthand what it is like to be unworthy and yet forgiven and released from the burden of what we have done. We need to know, we need to understand the power to forgive does not come from us, but it comes from God to us through the gospel. When Jesus taught us to pray, Right? Forgiveness is baked into the prayer. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. People who have received forgiveness from God should forgive those who have hurt them. We have been forgiven of our sins through Christ. And the cross, friends, was the price of the forgiveness of our sins. That's what it cost Christ to forgive us. We sinned against God. But instead of making us pay, he paid. Isn't that the gospel? He paid. Right? We owe it. He paid it. And so as people who have received that kind of grace, as a people who have been forgiven like that, we must forgive. To not forgive is to hold that judgment over your brother or sister. It is to condemn them. It is to consider them as dead. 
We have been forgiven. We must forgive. Are there sins this morning that you need to confess? Are there people you need to speak to who are here or maybe not here? If there are sins that need to be confessed, then do it today. Don't do it tomorrow. Don't do it next week. Do it today. If you need to repent to a brother or a sister, then do it today. Have you been withholding forgiveness from someone who sinned against you? Have they asked for forgiveness and you have refused to give it? Friends, forgive them today. Forgive them today. Because church, we, we have been forgiven by Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we have been made in the image of God, each one of us possessing a unique and undeniable dignity. And yet we fail to live in a way that reflects your glory and your character. We do not kill with our hands, but we withhold forgiveness and and harbor bitterness and stubbornly refuse to repent. And so, Lord, would you forgive us? Would you teach us to value and cherish all human life in a way that honors and glorifies you? And will you fill us with your grace that it might overflow to those around us? It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.